Hey, what's up, Rattler? So, a couple of weeks ago, I get this message from a guy, I have no idea who it is, and he says, hey Dave, I'm gonna start a reptile rescue. Do you have any ball python morphs that you can donate to my reptile rescue? And I stopped and I thought, buddy, that's not how it works. And then I thought, this would make a really cool subject for a video. So I called my friend Erica Mead down here in Chicago, got in the car, came down here to Friends of Scales, which is the only 501c3 nonprofit reptile rescue in the state of Illinois. So I asked Erica Mead and Ann Hughes to do this video with me to show what it takes to actually run a successful reptile rescue. I'm Dave Kaufman, and I tour the world to see how reptiles are living in the wild. And while I'm at it, checking out some of the most amazing facilities and reptile expos as well. It's all about learning, appreciation, and conservation. So come with me and join my reptile adventures. At Rainbow Mealworms, we grow all our insects 100% naturally so that you get the freshest, most lively feeders on the market. So for all your reptile food needs, place your order today at rainbowmealworms.net. So this is Erica Mead. You are, now are you the founder of Friends of Scales or one of the founders? I am what so technically I'm one of the founders. In Illinois and in not-for-profits, you have to have three founders, and I am one of three founding members. We've been around for nine years. Nine as years. a um, reptile rescue, just in general, we've been around for 10 years. We broke a decade, actually, this year. Nice. So as I said in the intro, you are the only 501c3 not-for-profit reptile rescue in the mm -hmm. state of Illinois. Yes. We are a sole reptile rescue. All we do is amphibians, reptiles, and invertebrates, um, so we're technically a herpetile rescue and invertebrate rescue. But we're the only one that does that. We don't take in any other exotic animals and we don't host any meetings. Um, the Herp Society does, in the area does work with rescues, but we don't host meetings or act as a herpetological society. So, all right, kind of walk us through the process of how a reptile rescue works. So somebody has a reptile that they can't keep for whatever reason, they call you and then what happens next? So best way to do it is actually to go through our website and to go onto the relinquishment page and fill out that tiny little questionnaire because then it has all the information that we need to contact you and we can set up the fosters that we need set up. Then we go through, we screen, make sure everything looks good. Everything is gonna have a place to go because that's important for us. We don't wanna say, yeah, we'll totally take your animal and then we have no place to put your animal. And then we set up a time for you to come and meet us actually in Wheeling, because we are a foster-based organization. You're doing really good work here. I mean, look at this. You've got very sizable enclosures here for these rescues, huge tortoise tubs and turtle tubs. So now, I would think that being a reptile rescue, you would not want to take in any rescue animals. I mean, isn't that kind of the goal of a res reptile rescue? Oh yeah, no, our goal is to be completely out of business. Like, we don't want to be around. To be completely honest, we don't want to be around. But we are because people need a place that they can trust to go. And it's not people who are abusing animals. It's people who they can't take them with them because they're going someplace. Or somebody ha something happens, they get sick. People who are, actually a lot of them are like terminal illnesses. Where yeah. do those animals go? They need right. some place to go. And we're always going to have a place in society because people need some place that they can trust to bring their animals. And we fill that niche now. So obviously you have a leopard gecko. Yeah, yeah. How many leopard geckos do you actually take into the rescue? In a year? Yeah. I don't want to count. Like one year we legitimately had over like 90 leopard geckos oh, come boy. in. It was rough. It was a rough, it was a rough year. It was a rough year. Um, this year though, we only had about like 30 something. Like probably about 30 something. Oh, it wasn't, bad. Bad. It wasn't a okay. bad year for Manageable. This guy is just stunning. I mean, look at that back. That is a gorgeous gecko. And they all get adopted for the same price. I We don't care what morph they are. That's one thing that's, that's one thing I actually love about, you know, our rescue is we don't care about the morph. We don't ask about the morph. I don't want to know the morph of anything because if I tell them the morph, then I'm going to tell people the morph because I feel morally obligated to tell people sure. morphs if I know what they are. But like guys like this one, this guy is going to just absolutely be wonderful. He actually already has a home. So he's actually just waiting for Tuesday so that his doctor can come and pick him up. Nice. So he's super excited about that. She's really excited about it too. So here is Ann so Hughes. Low. So being a 501c3 nonprofit organization, you have to have a board. Mm -hmm. And so how many board members do you currently have? We have nine. Nine board members. Yes. 
Okay. And what are the what are the what's the everyday kind of duties of how to run a reptile rescue? So there is actually a lot of duty picking up actually in a reptile Literally. rescue. Um, part of it is wrangling our fosters, which is Anne's specialty is trying to wrangle all of our fosters. And then a good chunk of it is actually just trying to make sure that we have people who are getting the word out there and being a positive influence. Um, that's a really big one actually, is finding people who are not doing it as a self-serving measure, but are trying to better improve the reptile community and just improve reptile awareness in general. And that's what we really push for with our directors is like your job when you're not at a show doing outreach is you need to go and be a positive ambassador for us as a rescue but also the reptile community as a whole and the way that you do that is expos and expos, how other we do it um at expos we'll do it at like library events our educational so two of our um, directors actually do social media posts things like that so it's just general gentle outreach but it's also offering education when we can. And a lot of people who do the applications come and talk to us at these events, and we've already recognized the names, and we have the names down. We can be like, yeah, cool. Right. You can talk to you. This is groovy. And, you know, we'll work with that. There are some times where we'll talk to people, and we'll be like, this is not going to be an animal that's a good fit for you. Let's go the other way. But at expos and stuff, it's a really good way for us to bring um, starter animals for you know families who are beginning or families who just want to trap out like a ball python or a bearded dragon or a leopard gecko we're not going to bring super exotic animals necessarily to those expos we want to bring in the starter animals so that you know little timmy when he comes in can come just talk to us sure and we can have that conversation and so a lot of the screening process at those expos is just talking to them for a long time so this guy actually came in from the green bay aquarium amnesty day that, so we're partnered with them and we accept in the reptiles that come in. This time we took in a Diamondback Terrapin and a Savannah Monitor and this guy was relinquished because he's aggressive. Mm -hmm. um, he's not horrible, he just doesn't like life. I can hear the huffing and puffing. Yeah. Um, and he wasn't fed well. So this guy was fed a diet of rodents and he was fed primarily rodents and turkey. He's fat, he's extremely fat and obese. Yeah. He's just not in a good way. He came in smelling, oh gosh, did he smell the high hack? He smelled like, he smelled like chicken. Oh yep. boy. Like a dead chicken. And he is very hungry. Um, we're having a little bit of a time trying to transition him over to an appropriate diet. Appropriate diets for Savannah monitors are completely insectivorous. They should not be eating rodents. They shouldn't be eating chicks. They are not a garbage disposal for your, like a tegu. They are not a garbage disposal like a king snake where you can just toss anything in there. They need to eat large amount of insects and they just don't receive them in captivity. And then what happens is you get these animals that are obese and they're just not doing well and it causes liver issues and it causes kidney issues with them. And then when they're not given enough room to roam in enclosures, the enclosures are too small. We also have the compounded problem that they're not getting enough exercise. And a lot of people, when they start to get aggressive, they're not taking them out either to let them get exercise. How are you guys paying for all of this equipment and all everything that goes in to caring for these animals until you find them really loving homes? So we get wonderful donations. Um, Zilla is a wonderful sponsor who donates enclosures like about once every year, once every other year, but also does help us out when we need it for our fosters. So that has been absolutely wonderful that they've been able to do corporate gifts like that. I concur that Zilla um, is a wonderful sponsor. Yes. <laughs> we do have some people who purchase um, enclosures and donate them to us and then we'll give those to fosters which has been absolutely wonderful as well. And then we have people who just flat out donate to us. So you can donate like through our PayPal, shameless drop right there, mm. um, which is on our website. But Which I will link below. Yep. yep. Um, but it's also just seeing us at expos or seeing us at outreach things when we're selling like t-shirts, stickers. So being a nonprofit, it's completely volunteer. You guys don't take a salary. You guys don't make a penny off of this and you're doing it just for the love of the reptiles and the amphibians and the community. Is that pretty accurate? Yep, that's completely accurate. It is a complete labor of love. You do pay for a relinquishment fee when you relinquish to us. It's a $50 relinquishment fee that we request. Um, and we have worked with people who couldn't pay it. That's been a thing we've done. 
But we do ask for a fifty dollar relinquishment fee to help us take care of the animals. Sure. And then when we adopt out animals, the highest that we've ever adopted out an animal for was seventy five dollars. Most of the animals that we adopt out are ten dollars to forty, and that's it. Hmm. So we believe that adopters shouldn't have to pay large sums of money to rescue an animal and that it is the obligation of the person relinquishing to provide for the animal that is being, you know, given to somebody else. But adopters should honestly not be forced to pay like a $200 adoption of course. fee when they're trying to do the right thing in their heart. You find people who support you. You find people who have to support you. You have to be willing to put your own money where your mouth is. There's nobody that's going to financially back you. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't get finance. I don't. I still don't have financial backing. Actually, we don't have a corporate sponsor that financially backs us. Um, and you know, don't, it's like don't routinely. expect sponsorship. You're yeah, not, and you're it's not going to get it. Routinely, like giving us sponsorship in like a check form or anything sure. like that. Um, even for special events that we do, we have to scrimp. We save. We budget. So when you make it that you know you open your home to people in need, and it is, let's face it, Reptile Rescue, it's kind of like veterinary medicine where people are like, I get into it because I love the animals, but you also get into it because you love people. Sure. And you get into Reptile Rescue because you love reptiles, but also because you love, you have a need to help people. And I have a need to help people who are in a bad spot or who want to get that first animal and stuff like that. And so that's something that we're passionate about doing is just keeping that good faith with everybody. We don't want to hurt the community we serve. We want to help serve it better. We get all sizes of beardies. We get little ones. We get the big ones. We get geriatrics. We get them when they are... Uh, sometimes when they are sick, we get them when they are angry, we get them when they just simply can't be cared for anymore. Kids going off to college. When um, people are moving. People move out of state and instead of taking them with them, sometimes they just can't take them with them. Um, financial reasons, they just can't, you know, upbeat. Right. Um, we get a lot of people that their life has just changed and they've become so busy they no longer have time to play with them. And they used to play with them all the time, and now they're just their life is just too hectic, and they just don't feel like they have the time for them anymore. So they give them up to us, hoping that we'll be able to find them a family that has the time for them. And that's what we're trying to do, is try and find them a family that wants to spend a lot of time with them. So like this little guy here, uh, so far he seems to be doing pretty good, so he might be able to probably be up for adoption fairly quickly. So this one, you said, came in with mites. Yep, this one came in with mites. Came in really emaciated. You can tell by the little chugging goal that you were talking about. The fact that we are just all skin. We're all squish. I know, my love. But it has done exceptionally well. Just absolutely well. An animal comes in infested with mites like this. How are you treating them for mites? So, um, we can do different methods. There is, we use, um, Ivermectin, we also use Fipronol to treat the environments too. We can use alcohol that actually kills eggs when you're treating enclosures. It's laborious, but it's something that you have to do and that's part of the commitment to it. Um, but the alcohol does desiccate the eggs, which is absolutely fantastic and that helps break the cycle. So this is Gully. Uh, it's actually a she. She uh, came in from a woman who absolutely loved her and moved out of the country and moved to Australia. And Australia does not let you bring your reptiles into the country. Indeed they don't. So she um, gave her to us to find a new home. And it's a long process to find uh, the right owner for a large monitor lizard. So it is not something that is an easy process. It does take a while. And uh, we do require that owner new owners for large animals, both monitor lizards and large snakes, do provide us the proof of the new enclosure. So steps like that and just, you know, going through the, re the regular application process. Yeah, so um, one, of the, one of the other things um, that, is, that can be tricky is you do have to be 18 to adopt from us. So you do have to prove that you are of age. Sure. We pull her out and play with her. I'm not going to lie. She gets a lot of extra attention because 
She's just so darn sweet. And look at her loving it. She's eating oh, that up. Gosh. So the other side of the coin is, being the animal lovers that we are, especially mm -hmm. reptiles, I'm sure you get a couple of rescues in here that just break your heart because of the condition of the animal. Yep. We have... Uh, we had one come in that was named Zombie. It was a red tailed boa that came in and her face was all chewed up and bitten up. She had renal issues, so kidney issues. Um, she was she had sand coming out of her mouth. She had sand coming out of her cloaca, so the back end of the vent. She had just, oh, no. she was crunchy, she was dehydrated. And uh, Dr. Horton actually over at Chicago Exotics did some like experimental style medicating with her. And we actually were like grinding up alpyrinol tablets and at one point trying to put that down and she couldn't hold down the fluids and so then we were putting down alpyrinol tablets and actually pilling the snake, which you don't really do very often. Sure. Um, and then two feeding her afterwards and she did extremely well and then she got adopted out but we had her for, almost, for over a year and something before she was finally strong enough and I remember the first time she actually ate for me. I was like so ecstatic. It was like this big seven foot snake. And like the first time she ate, it was like this little mouse. And I was just like, yes, you <laughs> ate. And I was like super excited. I'm like, you're not going to die. And they're like, oh, you might. And then she did it. And I was like, yes. <laughs> so this is a Brooks King snake that is plenty large. He is huge. Um, sweet snake, just very, very big. He's actually much thinner, thinner than he was when he came into us. Uh, when he first came into us, he actually had like a shelf booty going on. He's like, whoop. Yeah, I know, I see your little tail. Oh, good God. So he was fed primarily um, pinkies and hoppers beforehand, which are just fat, you know, right. high fatty foods. And you don't see it very often in king snakes, so that was kind of weird. Normally you see it in like, the corn snake was like, yeah, I'm just gonna drag this thing behind me for now. But he ended up with it and it was just wicked to see this guy and he's been doing great i mean we give him a little bit of food every now and then you know let him work it off because you don't want him to just you know keep metabolizing his own fat stores it's not good for his liver to do that sure but you know he's on the monthly feeding schedule now and for a colubra that's insanity sure but he's doing fantastic with it and he's looking good and you know he's not anywhere near as fat as he used to be, so that's kind of nice. It does take a really bad toll on their organs. I mean, what happens to their organs? It sits in the, it destroys the liver, it just envelops their heart, it, so with their kidneys. So snakes' bodies, they're not pressurized like human bodies mm -hmm. are. So all the organs are elongated, obviously, in the snake, but mm -hmm. it's not like the fat is on the outside of their skeletal system like we have it. The fat in a snake, when they're obese, is inside with their organs, basically suffocating their organs. Exactly. And that's why obesity is so dangerous for snakes. Mm-hmm. It's going to take a long time for, like, those fat cells to actually really start to dissolve, right. unfortunately, and it's just going to be an uphill battle for this little guy. So you've got these bins of tortoises here, and then you've got red foots down here. Um, but I see that a lot of these tortoises have beaks. So one of my favorite conversations is nutrition. Um, so nutrition actually plays a very important role in Russian tortoises, box turtles, red foot tortoises, sulcatas. Oh my God, the sulcata beaks. So the problem is, is that people are um, offering preferential feeding diets. So like the herders will be like, I like this and I like this. And they'll just keep eating like one type of food. And then they're like, well, it likes this. And then they keep feeding it that. And then either don't try it on anything else or they try it on something else, but it keeps wanting to eat that. And they don't give, make it try something else. They're just like, oh, well, we'll just let you eat that. Sure, sure. So, so Myrtle the turtle nutrition. likes this, so I'm going to feed it this exclusively. Exactly. So we're getting nutritional deficiencies. Um, so you're getting deficiencies in some places, and then you're actually getting nutrition overloads in other places. So you might be getting too much protein in one place, not enough vitamin A in another. And that's really common, especially in your box turtles and in your Russian tortoises. Huge, huge, huge problem that we're seeing in these guys. For some reason, box turtles, because they're omnivorous, people feed them like the weirdest things too. So we get them coming in eating like Swiss cheese. They come oh in eating God. mac and cheese. So these nutritional deficiencies and overgrowth or at her um, overloads are actually causing keratin overgrowth in a lot of cases. And it can be because they're not getting worn down naturally. It can also be because of the vitamin nutrition issues. 
Um, it's just a lot of different variabilities that go into it. A lot of it is protein related too, but a good chunk of it is just diet related. People are just not feeding them the proper diet. So that is Hades. Hades is a 12 year old uh, red tail boa that actually came into the rescue this week. This week. This boa is yeah. 12 years old. 12 years old. Oh boy. So look at how skinny and thin this snake is for being a 12 year old boa. Man, this should be a seven, eight foot snake. Mm-hmm. Oh, poor little dude. You're in good hands though. So he came into us. Um, he is, he was a little bit on the crankier end of the spectrum because he's, you know, a little bit stunted and quite a bit stunted. Um, no. Very, very hungry. Right. So we've been working with him. He's already accepted a meal and then that disappeared. So he already accepted another small meal and that disappeared. So a couple of days he'll be getting another small meal. We'll just see how he keeps going from there. But at this point it's gonna be just managing, getting him back onto a good feeding schedule and going from there. He is extremely lively and an absolutely wonderful snake. Um, the problem that we get with animals like this is when they're like this, they can survive a really long time, even with, you know, veterinary intervention and even with everything that you can offer and they still don't make it. Right. Um, and that's the frustrating part. And sometimes they end up, you know, it feels like you did it because like it's on you because they're in your care. And I so can totally understand that. I take it super personally when these ones don't make it because I'm like, I put my heart into them. I'm like, okay, we can do this. We got this, yep. we'll do this. And that is an unexpected um, pain point in rescue is you will sometimes find yourself with imposter syndrome. Um, and you'll also find yourself frequently with um, guilt. Right. A lot of guilt. I'm starting to turn red from thinking of the guilt. Like I <laughs> had to work on um, how much guilt I carry because I would hold everything that it was my fault. And mm. it's not, and I know it's not my fault, but you do, you hold it, you hold it responsible and it's just, it's so painful. But then the successes aren't as sweet. Like the successes start to turn to ash in your mouth and they're not as sweet anymore because you're like, well, this one was great but what about all the other ones and that gets hard that does get hard a lot so rattlers there it is i'm gonna put the links to friends of scales in the description below check them out and consider making a donation to help keep this going because not only is this rewarding work it's actually really important work so i'm gonna put all those links below seriously consider sending them some love and keeping this really awesome organization going so anyway rattlers until the next reptile adventure love the planet feed your reptile obsession and rattle on